Hi, everyone. Let's test this out. Let's find your seats, please, and start to quiet down. Welcome to the first lecture of CS188 at Berkeley, Artificial Intelligence. And I'm Nathan Lambert, and Satish is over here on the side, and we're going to be co-instructing this class. And it's very exciting to be here. Love to see this full room with all of you guys. And just to dive right in, where was probably your first encounters with AI in your life? There's a lot of science fiction has been loving this for a long time. And here's a first example. Have, do you guys know who these are? Who's on the right? So, yell it out. Someone give me it. Who's, yeah. And what does he do? Yeah, so he, he talks between different cyborgs and humans. He's really like a Google Translate, but he has a lot of anxiety. And how about the one on the left? What does he do? It's hard to say. He's kind of spunky, he's funny, he does a little bit of everything, but it's less clear for us. So we've got Google Translate, we know it works, and it's really hard for us to create these kind of general robots for now and especially hard to create any sort of emotion, any sort of character that we would see in there. And then this was in the 70s. In the 80s, things started to get a little darker. We've got these killer robots coming back, and really they look close to C-3PO, but what's changed here is really just the software underneath it. And then we're keeping, this software theme has continued, and we have the Matrix, which is this whole society of an intelligent software eating what was humanity. And then even today, things can get creepier again, where we have ex machina, where we're starting to lose track of whether or not an AI is a human and who we really are as a self. And this is also encapsulated in Westworld, which is very scary to think about the implications of this in the next, ten decade, next decade or so even. But it's not all negative. There's a lot of fun sci-fi and games. And then we also have Wally. Not sure what Wally is good for humans or not, but there's a sci-fi has shown you so much of the capabilities of AI to start with. But this always looks at the future and where are we today? Today we've got these great things like self-driving cars. I'm guessing very soon we're going to be able to get self-driving Ubers, take us where we want to go, take us to class, which is just amazing. It has tons of opportunities for helping our society. Then also we have great things like medical robots that are working in hospitals to help keep track of patients, help deliver drugs, all these things. Then you have these consumer goods. You can go online, buy one of these Skydio drones for about 900 bucks, and it'll create spectacular automatic cinematic uh, videos of your exercises, of anything that you want to do. So this class is going to lead into how do all these things work on a high level. You should be able to generally understand these arguments and how to figure out how to address these problems and make awesome products for people to use. So today, what is AI is going to happen? We're going to tell you at a high level what AI is doing. We're going to give some fun history on where did AI come from? Should we be worried about things? Should we not be worried about things? And we're going to go through all the logistics so you know exactly what you're going to be doing in this class, what's expected of you, and all that. So just to start with the first point, what is AI? So AI started, a lot of it emerged from neuroscience. So we saw the human brain, we're like, can we make something that thinks like people? We see a, every one of you has this amazing capability to learn, to reason. If we had one computer that could do the likes of that, it would be mind blowing. The capabilities would be incredible. And then once we learned from neuroscience, could we think like people? We also know that the human brain has these flaws. So instead of just thinking like people, can we do better? and think rationally. There's a lot of background in philosophy like Aristotle. Aristotle would probably be an AI researcher if he was alive today. The, there's just so much impact in how does this influence our world? What does it mean that these machines are thinking in some way? And we'd love, he would definitely love to see more. And then if we can think rationally, once we have thought, we're going to want to be able to make things that impact the world. So we're really curious about robotics. We're curious about things that can act like people. This is first covered by Alan Turing, where he had the Turing test, which was like, can a robot fool a human? Can you put a robot on the other side of a wall and try to convince me that it's human? 
and we passed this Turing test in 2014. So we're starting to get artificial intelligence that can act like a human. And even better yet, can we get something better than me up here on stage? Can we get something that acts rationally, has its definition of what is rational, and can just go and do its best every single time and address a whole lot of different concerns and problems? And it would be incredible. But what does actually acting rationally mean? This is a huge part of the course, and we wanted to find, and we're trying to think of rational in a very specific way. It sounds great if we have some sort of AI, some sort of computer doing things, but we need very specific ways to make this into a math problem. For the engineers, we need to make this into computer science. We need to be able to code it up. We need to be able to do it, which is where you all get to see these ideas that we're going to give to you, and you get to go into your computer, and in an hour, you can have something that solves a problem, which is an incredible feeling. And I, you should all get this in the course. But specifically, rational, what does this mean? We're going to try to achieve a predefined goal. So if something is rational, it has its conception of you, it has this idea of utility. What is the problem it's trying to solve? So a rational agent in this, in this class or as an undergrad could reward itself for getting an A. It could say like 10 points for an A, but then it could have a weird utility function that only gives one point for a Friday afternoon with friends. So you're going to have to balance these utility functions where these agents are going to be doing what you tell them to do. So the utility is very important, and being rational means maximizing the specific expected utility. We'll go into these words more in a second, but when you think about an agent that maximizes utility with a computer, a better name for this course might be computation rationale, computational rationality, which is ultimately just saying we want to make a computer that can, in a reasonable way, explore one goal and create actions to accomplish that. So what is a, the one phrase that you should take away from this lecture is maximize your expected utility. That's what a rational agent would be doing. It's going to be formulated as a math and a computing problem with code in this class. But what does each one of these words mean? And where does it come from? So ultimately, if you see maximize, it's going to think of a lot, it's going to be a math problem. There's a lot of fields behind this with a lot of linear algebra, a lot of mathematics. You might hear the word convex optimization, non-convex optimization. You're setting up a math problem that this agent is going to solve. And what is utility? This is where a lot of the philosophy of AI comes in. You have utilitarianism for Jer from Jeremy uh, Bentham, but you could also define your utility in different ways. A lot of humans like to follow value-based ethics, which is from Aristotle or anything like that. And translating our values as humans into our AI is incredibly important. And these are decisions that you get to make when you're making robots of today, which is great. And then expected is where a lot of the probability will come in. But really, we want our agents to be being successful on average and be doing their best to be successful. It doesn't necessarily matter if the world goes against them and they don't work, but it's expected utility. And then your, how do we make this personal? How are you guys acting? How are you making your agents act? And this leads nicely into, if you're an agent maximizing your expected utility, what's our, what is our tool? We're, we're using the brain. And is this a good mechanism for intelligence? Is, is this where we want to go? It's kind of like we saw flying animals for so long. So we knew that flying was possible for creatures on Earth. But it wasn't until we stopped making robots or stopped making crafts that had flapping wings that we learned to fly. So we don't know if we're going to be able to solve intelligence with a brain structure. The brains are great, but they're very difficult. So the key words that we want to know and take away from the brain, we have a couple lessons. We know that the brains consolidate information as memory, and they use that in simulation to improve decision making. So memory is super important. If, if I build a robot, um, and it goes through one trial, it needs to remember some notion of that, or else if I would, there's no point in even testing it because in the future, it's not going to be able to do the same task. So that notion of memory, you use it, your education is building memory up from the ground up. And then simulation is when you take these consolidated memories, and then you, with the memory, you can then roll out in your, in your brain, you can plan, you can tweak the scenarios, and you can make even more information out of what you already have. So this is inspiration we want from the brain. We want our AIs to be able to have some notion of memory and some notion of planning. 
but we don't necessarily want it to just be a bunch of neurons that is very difficult to model. So how are we going to design rational agents? What is a rational agent? What would your, how would we set up a system to model our brain to see how it acts in the world? So we have these terms that we're going to use a lot in the class. So to start with, we have an agent. An agent is something that perceives and acts. It could be like you, it could be an automated highway camera, it could be an automated light, all sorts of things in our homes are becoming automatic. They see something you do, you come home, they turn on. But that's not the best that we want. That's just anything that interacts with the world. What we want is, you can see here, like this robot is trying to get the apple. How do we get this agent to be intelligent from sensors to actuators? What we want is an agent that is rational. We want an intelligent agent to maximize its utility. Again, this word utility comes up, that's going to be defined by the problem. You can see, essentially, the characteristics of the environment, of the actions, et cetera, determine what type of AI that we want to use. In this class, we will go through a variety of AI techniques so that when you see a problem, you know the general tool set that you want to use. And, that, and this is kind of handoff between new techniques and new problems that we give you so that you're going to be developing engineering skills and be able to get a new problem and say, this is the way that we could in distill in a computer intelligence to solve this problem. What is an example of an agent that I've played? I don't know. Hopefully, some of you have. But we have Pac-Man. This is a classic in this class. Come up in your coding assignment. Have any of you guys played Pac-Man? Oh, that's great. Love it. I wasn't sure how many people were. I think I've done it once or twice. It's surprisingly hard. And now I'm going to show you a video of someone in this class, like an AI in this class can solve this game. You guys can write code in Python. We'll give you the game where your little che eating cheese here can learn how to go after the, we've got the, in the bottom right, you have one of the special balls that gives its ability to eat the ghost, gain more score, and survive. So this is the kind of game not only are you doing in this class, but it comes into the cutting edge of AI. A lot of publicity from DeepMind is solving games. I guess there's sound as well. But did it. He won, which is great. So in summary of why, what is AI in your life? What is it doing? What is this class going to lead into? AI pretty much is touching every aspect of your life at this point. You wake up, you look at your phone, you're probably getting some version of language processing, computer vision coming in right away from whether or not it's your social media, your phone unlock does that. But also, the things that you guys probably hear a lot and want to do is machine learning, robotics. Machine learning is ultimately a subfield of AI. It leverages a lot of the philosophy, a lot of the underlying mathematics and understanding of what AI is doing to then make a decision-making agent, a rational agent that can take new information and make new decisions. Rather than just having a black box that knows how to act in one environment, machine learning knows how to lets us build tools that act in new environments, which is ultimately what the human brain is doing. This is a new environment for you all here today, and you're learning the best way to make these a AI agents. So what is this class going to look like for all of you on a day-to-day -day basis? We're going to take a few minutes here to go through the logistics and then back to a lot of fun examples of AI. So here's the staff. I'm Nathan Lambert, and Satish is down here. I would ask all the TAs that made it to stand up. We're not going to do names. If any TAs make it, at least Satish can stay up, stand up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So these are your TAs. Not going to go through all the names, but please, you see me or Satish, or we have Mizu or head TA who is doing a fant fantastic job already. You see any of us on campus, smile, come talk to us about robotics, talk to us about AI in the news, whatever you want. I would love to meet you, learn all of your names if I can. It's going to be a few a second if all of you come to office hours. But please talk to us and engage with staff. And then next. First thing that you probably have to put in your calendars today, exam dates. There's no alternate exams. We need you guys to come to the final if you want to pass. Put these in your calendar now. It's, it's a large class. This is the only way to accommodate all of you. And 
I'll give you a second to write it down if you need to. Lecture slides will be online and I'll get to the website right here that'll have all of this information again. So similar to a lot of your courses, we've got this website, schedule, slides, homeworks, projects, all of that goes here. Please take a look. The website will link to, will also link to this piazza. You should have been auto-enrolled. If you're joining late, you can let us know if you can't join the piazza. It's great for private matters. You can post there, but the best way I want to encourage you to ask questions, anything relevant to AI, please post publicly, publicly ask questions, create discussion. It's an amazing group of people here we have now that will be able to see all of these and build on the community here. Like Piazza, we use Gradescope as our primary infrastructure. Should have been auto-enrolled. If not, the slides will be posted. The link access code is here, and you'll get all of your assignments through here, grades. Should hopefully you guys are familiar with this. Course format, lectures Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We want you to be here. I love to see how many of you are here today. It's awesome. Early this semester, keep the momentum going. There's gonna be a small portion of your grade that can be improved with participation points, and the easiest way to get those will just be showing up to lecture, and we'll talk about this on the next slide. And then other than lecture, there's going to be discussions. You can go to whatever discussion you want. Ultimately, there's gonna be standard discussions that are more lecture-based, and then there's gonna be a second type that, has, that builds practice problems for you, for you all. Would encourage primarily to try to go to the discussion ones, and then the ex exam prep discussions are mostly supplementary. So you should go to whichever one helps you learn the most, but you can even go to both types if you want. No assigned discussions, but it's great to pick one TA, and that can be your point of contact with the course, and really helps as individuals. What are these lecture points I mentioned? So you can get a max of 20 participation points through whatever mode that you want. So the other alternatives are through Piazza participation and building that relationship with your TA and um, section. But easiest way to do it is come to lecture. If you go to this link, it'll just enter your student ID number and then you'll get your one point for normal lectures. We're going to have some really exciting guest lectures from people in advanced topics and some people from Berkeley and some people from elsewhere to show you what is happening with AI in the world today. Those will be worth more points. We really want you to be here in person. I want to see the room like this when those happen and you'll get points for doing so. Yeah, so this link will be online later. I'll leave this one open because you guys didn't know it was coming. And then homeworks. Homeworks will be due Wednesdays at midnight. Essentially, you're gonna have, most of the homeworks are exercises based on class material. We cover search. It's gonna be, what you're, you'll have to answer a conceptual question about what are the different types of search. These are, you should be getting 100% on them. You should be able to understand what the answers are, if not, Ask questions, that's what we want. And then you do get a couple uh, drops for these, but there are no slip days. So just be aware of that. All this information will be online, and I'm def you guys can read what's going on behind as well. So projects. There's a few projects in this class, which I think are the most exciting part of the class, where you actually get to take some of the Python skills that you've had from these earlier classes and code up agents that work. They're gonna be due Wednesdays at midnight. You can work in a small group or alone. But I think this is a very core part of the group and, or core part of the course and would happily answer any questions that you guys have, have about this. They're running pretty well. And then with the projects, there's contests where you can then submit your code and see how you compare to other people in the class. This is something I look forward to following. And then in the past, students have also come up with fun names for different uh, contests like Alpha Ghost for Pac-Man, Pac Lives Matter, MyTeam.Pi, didn't work out, and um, shots and goggles. You know, it's fun. We want you guys to have fun with it and engage. That's the best way to learn, is to be trying your best on these assignments, and I think the contest when you're like, can I get better than one other group, is a great way to just motivate you and just see what's going on here. And then there's a couple of written homeworks that are designed to be very similar, or a little bit harder than exams, but you're, we're gonna design new questions as a content team and we're gonna put them out. There's gonna be 
about four. There's going to be four in the semester, but you don't have to worry about having electronic and written homework at the same time. There'll be a few electronic homeworks and then a written homework, and you won't have them due at the, be due at the same time or anything like that. With all these homeworks, a lot of it is online. Have integrity with the online systems. There's a lot of information passed directly to us. Don't cheat, not worth it. So for office hours, there's going to be a lot of coverage of uh, TA office hours. Pretty much every day, all afternoon, there should be someone manning the office hour room. And please go, especially early in the semester where you might feel like you're on top of things. Just go build that relationship, build that habit. It'll help a lot. And a lot of the undergrad staff have taken this class before, taught this class before, so they'll know how to help you with your projects. I would love to talk about them and help you, but I could be more helpful in concepts, talking about where AI is going, and Satish would say the same thing. Where should you be if you're in this class? We recommend 61A and 61B and 70 for being in this class. That is because we aren't teaching you how to program, and there is a math-heavy section at the end of the course. The second half of the course where we get into machine learning, there is a lot more linear algebra, a lot more probability. So the diagnostics are made to make sure that you know how to do that, but you might not see the, what the diagnostics are showing until later on in the course. Textbook. I really like this book. It's not required. Any students that want to know what is going on in more aspects of AI and what builds up into this and connections, it's great. It's not required, but there's, it just expands on material, would complement lecture very nicely. Laptops and lecture. So it's actually a pretty good crowd right now, not a lot of laptops. Ultimately, laptops aren't great for those learning around you. What, you would, what the research shows is that laptops hurt people behind you more than yourself, but sadly, this class is not curbed, so that doesn't even help you. So just please, if you're gonna be in, be using a laptop, please sit on the side or the back, but we understand that's how a lot of students take notes now, just be courteous. We want you to build a community in this course. AI, AI at Berkeley is a wonderful community. I've been amazed by the amount of research, the students since I've gotten here, and I'd love to meet you. I know a lot of you will engage in that manner, and we want you guys to feel like you're part of this community and contributing. But like, help your peers on Piazza, help people out in person, but most of this comes down to we want you to be really courteous in your tone and understanding of what people's situations might be. It's just everyone misspeaks sometimes. Everyone comes with their past biases. There's a lot of different backgrounds in this room. It's just please be courteous. If you see someone do something wrong, just say, hey, I didn't feel great. But that's all you can do. Just check yourself, think about what you're saying, and build a great set of people in here. Logistics summary. There's a few things that you should just double check this week. Make sure you can access all the websites and start thinking about these first projects. Sections and office hours will officially start next week. I'll be around after lecture if you guys have any questions. Happy to answer them, point you in the right direction. Okay, back to the fun stuff. This is why I'm here, and we're gonna talk about history of AI, and then we're gonna run through a great set of fun examples and see like what is AI doing today. So this video here is from the 1950s. People thought that we might solve AI then. Laboratory of Electronics at MIT. Dr. Wiesner, what really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is, can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. And today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. I suspect if we come back in four or five years, I'll say, sure, they really do think. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? We're just really beginning to understand the capabilities of the computer. I've got some film to illustrate this point, which I think will amaze you. That man isn't playing checkers against the computer, is he? Sure, and it plays pretty well. Now, which color... While most computer scientists saw it as a mere number cruncher, 
A small group thought that the digital computer had a much grander destiny. Being a general purpose machine, it could be programmed to do things which in humans require intelligence, play games like checkers and chess, and solve brain teasers. Let's see what it's turning out. The field became known as artificial intelligence. Can machines really think? Even the scientists argue that. I'm convinced that machines can and will think. I don't mean the machines will behave like men. I don't think for a very long time we're going to have a difficult problem distinguishing a man from a robot. And I don't think my daughter will ever marry a computer. But I think the computers will be doing the things that men do when we say they're thinking. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratory which is not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. They hadn't reckoned with ambiguity when they set out to use computers to translate languages. A $500,000 supercalculator, most versatile electronic brain known, translates Russian into English. Instead of mathematical wizardry, a sentence in Russian is to be said... One of the first non-numerical applications of computers, it was hyped as the solution to the Cold War obsession of keeping tabs on what the Russians were doing. Claims were made that the computer would replace most human translators. Now, listen, of course, you're just in the experimental stage. When you go in for full-scale production, what will the capacity be? We should be able to do about, with a modern commercial computer, uh, about one to two million words uh, an hour. And this would be quite an adequate speed to cope with the whole output of the Soviet Union. It's just a few hours computer time a week. When do you hope to be able to achieve the speed? If our experiments go well, then perhaps within uh, five years or so. And finally, Mr. McDaniel, does this mean the end of human translators? It's a yes for uh, translators of scientific and technical material, but as regards poetry and novels, no, I don't think we'll ever replace the translators of that type of material. Mr. McDaniel, thank you very much. Just listening to this video, there's a couple of really interesting things. You got people like Claude Shannon, who founded pretty much a huge section of electrical engineering, which is information theory and how communications are made, and some other very famous scientists that say in their lifetime they're going to have general intelligence, which is something we're still talking about today, which is falls into the optimism of what's going on. And you'll see in this history that this was during a big optimism period in AI, which we're in the second one of. So early days of AI was from thinkers who made computers thinking, wow, these are awesome machines. Can, how far are they going to go? And they're starting to think that just room-sized calculators are going to be able to be general intelligence. And then at this meeting in the 50s at Dartmouth, they coined the term artificial intelligence. And from there, the field was pretty much born. And there's a very big growth period where we had what was called expert systems, where they're trying to model the decision-making of an expert human brain, where these were starting to trickle into industry but then people started to figure out that the cost of these giant computers was not necessarily worth it, and there was a giant bust, and AI and in industry died out, much slowing of the research progress in AI, until the statistical approaches in the 1990s came about. So leveraging a lot of probability, the researchers learned that they can make a lot of inference and use these AI systems in way more ways than they initially thought in the 1950s, and then we, this led into where we are today, which is the spectac spectacular convergence of AI theory, linear algebra, into deep learning, which has touched so many aspects of our life that I started to hint at. And the difference is orders of magnitude more engagement from industry now than was in the first AI spring in the 60s and 70s, which leads towards this is not going away and this is going to be a new state of being which you'll see in a lot of these examples. So what can AI do? We're going to have your first quiz in CS188. We're going to say whether or not a lot of these things can be done. Do you guys think that AI can play a game of Jeopardy? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys know who the famous case of this in the 90s? Yeah, it was IBM Watson versus um, Ken Jennings, who is a legendary Jeopardy player. And this was just showing that human level memory could be made in rapid time. And then again, we had, can humans win against chess? This has been shadowed by recent events, but yes, again, IBM, which was a 
foundational computing company for making mainframes showed that they could fit enough compute and understanding to solve a game like chess. And how about Go? Yeah, so DeepMind did this recently, which is awesome. But for example, Go has about 30,000 initial moves, where chess can do something like 400. It's that order of magnitude on moves, and Go has a way longer game length and planning horizon. This is just a massive increase in computational ability and paired with new innovations in AI. How about tennis or table tennis or any sport like that? Any takers? Raise your hand. Be, be bold with these. Yeah. Yeah. So you can go online. If you Google table tennis video, you'll find something like CES this year where they've got robot arms like you see in the labs here just playing with people. Not a lot of problem. Te real tennis would be hard just moving back and forth, but it's pretty much there. How about grab a particular cup and put it on a shelf? So you need to train a robot to help you at your house, and all of your cups are the same. Can you do it? Any takers? You guys need to be more optimistic on what AI can do, because we're pretty much crushing all of these still. And when you, when you set it up, you'll see some videos, but these things are really starting to happen now in the last five years. A lot of these green check marks are new from the last few years of the class. How about unload your messy dishwasher at home? Can we do that yet? Unsure, but not, not really. The problem is we don't know how to do unknown environments. And You've got, probably got all sorts of weird dishes, reusable containers from takeout in there, and that's what makes it hard. If you've got uniformity, we might be able to do it, but the unknown is hard for these robots. How about drive safely on the highway? Yeah, this is a good one. I say yes. I changed this to a green arrow this year. The autopilot systems that we have today are phenomenal. Injury death rates are way down below human levels, and we can do this. What happens if you take a Tesla, take the driver out, and try to get it to run, drive up Telegraph? You guys going to feel OK about that? No, that's not, that's not really going to work. There's too much uncertainty. And this is the problem that we don't really, that's so hard to solve. What, what kind of AI are we going to need? What kind of AIs, plural, are we going to need to do something like this? And this is kind of the gap. We have the highway, which is the, it's nicely confined. It's really easy to set up the problem. There's these markers in the road. The other cars behave reasonably most of the time, and we can do it. Telegraph is hard. Can you buy a week's worth of groceries? Can, has anyone done this on their phone? You guys buy groceries online? Does it work? You know, a couple of yeses out here. Yeah, you, you can buy your groceries on your phone. You go, to, you go to Whole Foods in San Francisco, you got more people with brown bags doing to-go orders than you do with real people shopping sometimes which is kind of remarkable. There's all these, these are all powered by AI trying to, that are helping people live a life that's ultimately more busy, but it can take care of all these little things on the side. How many of you guys been to Berkeley Bowl? Yeah, do you think the same thing would work there? No. So this is the difference. So uh, like if we have a Whole Foods, everything's structured, Amazon sets it up for this. They're designed for, they're designing their future for AI, they're designing buying new companies to integrate AI into to make money, to make life easier. But Berkeley Bowl, great grocery store, is way too hectic, too many carts, too many varieties, and things don't quite work out. So it's kind of the gap between a structured problem and a new, innovating, cutting-edge cutting, cutting edge environment that we, we really want that to work. I want to be able to get fresh produce from Berkeley Bowl, but it's not really on our immediate horizon. How about discover and prove new mathematical theorems? Can we replace professors up here? Can we replace him, the theory of man? Thoughts? No? Any yes? Yeah? That's, I, I'm somewhat optimistic about this. There's actually really recent research, some of which out of Facebook, where they're trying to, you give them super ugly uh, symbolic math like you get in 16B final or something, and they're starting to be able to be like, oh, that's the integral of arctan or something with a Taylor approximation. They're, they're making progress on it, which is ultimately just, is very cool because mathematical symbols are way more abstract. When you think of a lot of AI, you think of computer vision that's making these layers to create, like, create lines, create shapes, create ideas like the human eye does, but doing that in a different black box that you guys do very easily, which is mathematical symbols, is interesting and happening now. How about perform a surgical operation? Would you guys have robot do a part of your surgery? 
Yeah? I, yeah? Good. I, I'm totally on board for this. It's not everything. I mean, you have things like LASIK surgery where it's a robot operator and it's in tandem with humans. But I've also seen some great things at conferences where you have non-invasive surgeries enabled by robots and intelligence. And then you have all other field of medicine where you had a recent result from Google Health where AI might be better at identifying, at looking at mammograms than human doctors. And pretty much every month you're going to see something new in the health space, which is really exciting. How about real-time translation? Anyone? How many people have Google Translate on their phone right now? Yeah, I just, like, I just got back from Japan personally, and it does pretty, pretty amazingly at this. If you do, uh, you can select your language, download it before, and it's going to be able to almost in real time let you have a conversation with anyone in the world. That's remarkable. Think about if you go back 100 years and tell someone that this is going to be possible on something in your pocket. These things, every year, this list becomes more impressive because we can do them. If we think about translation, but if we don't give them the words, can the robots write a story for us? Anyone? No optimistic people. Let's, let's give a look at some of these funny stories. We're going to move and see, can we actually, what's going wrong? Why can't we do this? I'm going to read you a couple stories written by a robot, which was state of the art in the 1980s. And it seems like something we should be able to do. One day, Joe Bear was hungry. He asked his friend, Irving Bird, where some honey was. Irving told him there was a beehive in the oak tree. Joe walked to the oak tree. He ate the beehive. The end. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's going on here? It's, it's like, it's so close. The sentence structure is fine. All this stuff is fine. And then we just have this wacky ending. And it's like, oh, come on. Like, and you would think that it would be better. Let's try again. So Henry Squirrel is thirsty. He walked over to the river bank where his good friend Bill Bird was sitting. Henry slipped and fell in the river. Gravity drowned. The end. <laughs> it's like they just can't close out these stories. So what do you, have you guys ever done this on your phone? Ask Siri to tell you a story. Anyone try this? You, you, yeah, you got, we got a couple. It's honestly not a lot has changed. It's like Siri pretty much gives up. She's like once upon a time or no. Sometimes she's just self-deprecating and it's like it's not even worth trying. It's, it, it seems like something we should be able to do and I think that now it, there's more of this on the next slide and I have seen a couple examples that are way more encouraging than Siri. But the structured problems are great. So you talk at Siri, it's pretty good at figuring out what words you have been used, what words you're using. Dialogue systems work. Chatbots work OK. There's some famous bad examples. But a lot of, they do work. A lot of customer support uses chatbots, and it works for me. And then this is with language processing. We talked about Watson, which is a very expensive way to win 70 grand on Jeopardy. But these things work pretty well. You can see on the slide, translating what was a little news snippet. Or, and it works well. The words work. Some semblance of like, the emotion that's being said can be lost. There's little mistakes in here if you look closely. But we're getting so much closer to this with different types of language processing. That you see a lot of this in web search. You guys want to, what I think is the coolest AI text and story generation is this guy. You ultimately can write what your character does and it'll generate like a book where you are playing in the book with paragraphs. And it's very impressive with what it does. It's like playing a role playing game, but in a book form where you get to make the decisions, which I've found this a couple months ago and I was like, okay, like this is where Siri is going to be, uh, be going. This guy's probably going to get bought out. It was just a fun student who made this game and it's all over the internet. What else can we do? Computer vision. Some famous work in 2015, you might have heard ImageNet. This is remarkable. If you pick it, look at any of these, that all the AI is doing is taking in raw pixels from a camera, and then it says, oh, a boy's doing a backflip on a wakeboard. Yes, there are some spectacular fail failures and other things going on, but this is, this is pretty incredible that we're even at this point five years ago. In another five years, it'll be totally different, which is awesome. What are some other ways AI impacts your life? 
Google Maps, I'm sure you, you guys use this. Netflix is probably the one some people don't un know, but Netflix has the state of the art in recommending things for you. Ultimately, they figured out the best way. You open Netflix, everything you see on that first row is decided. It's not just the title, they decide which little thumbnail to put, they decide which full screen to put for you guys, and they have, there's been ex a lot of studies that show Netflix is doing way better than anyone else at this. They're better than other streaming services for now, and it's really a complicated recommendation system that uses a couple different pieces of artificial intelligence in this class. It's some deep learning, some structured problems, which is awesome. Okay, back to agents. What are some famous game agents that have happened in this class? The first class, or in AI, the first classic one was IBM again, which is Deep Blue versus Kasparov, a Russian chess champion in the 97. It was really close to happening in 96. Kasparov had some nice words. I'm like, oh, I could smell a new type of intelligence across the table. But as computation continued to improve, again, he lost. Not surprising, but in classic human fashion, hasn't proved anything. He's like on with his life. I'm still still superior as a human. And that probably says a lot about human nature more than AI in this example. Then last couple of years, seen this photo. We have Go, which is this dramatically complicated game, way comp more complex strategies. And then this uh, Lee Se Dole uh, came up against the AI from DeepMind, AlphaGo and it was left in tatters. The community was amazed. In this case, rather than just straight computation that the chess players understood, the AI from DeepMind came up with new strategies, and now that the, now the AI AlphaGo is teaching the best Go players, and they're learning in tandem, and the level of Go play is improving, which is way, I see this as a way bigger accomplishment. Before, it was just computation of chess, but now new strategies and games that humans have playing for hundreds of years are emerging. Where does this show in things like closer to human agents? How fast can these AIs learn? This is a little bit more general, where we don't have a whole team of engineers, rooms of computers, figuring out how to run. You get these fun little motions from things that you can run on your laptop. Like, you can, I could give you guys code to do this in an afternoon. This is easy. Most of it runs on your laptop way faster. It's not like DeepMind. But it's pretty reasonable. Take a baby, human baby, drop him on the ground, he's not going to do so, just so well. But obviously there's other char characteristics of bio other places in biology where things might just know how to do certain tasks. So there's a lot of underpinning on memory, genetic encoding of tasks, and all these things that build up the underpinning of AI, whether it's neuroscience, anything like this. These little examples are awesome. It's like iteration 20, this little ant is learning to walk around. This is happening at Berkeley too. Most of these research videos that we're showing is all here. This is an amazing place to be. These are all, these controllers, these agents, which is called reinforcement learning, are often working on these one task, one task at a time. Can we then, can we do multiple tasks? Can we do one agent that learns to play these four games at all? So can we play Atari? This has been slowly incrementing, but Reinforcement learning has been showing that you can take these images. So think about what do you get from this? What do we get here? We get eh, joint angles. The joints are here. The joints are there. You might have 10 measurements on this. You get things like the area of a square. So if you have 20 pixels on the bottom, you then have 400 measurements that are just showing you some sort of color. And we're still showing that these agents can learn. And what kind of things does this come into? In the real world, people have been using these a lot in super exciting ways. I work in robot learning like this, a little different. I don't use vision, but we have things like robot learning to fold a towel from nothing. We have self-driving cars. We've got some multi-agent. Um, we've got multi-agent coordinated games. We're still using vision. And then you have these super impressive, somewhat scary Boston Dynamics videos where the, like the future is here. These things are out there, and they can learn, they can learn new tasks. They can move in the world, they can interpret the world. And these things are all here. What does a video of one of these robots working look like? So have you guys tried to drill into a wall before? You guys do home improvement? Think this, these are robots doing everyday home tasks, and they look clunky, but when you know that these are working from just raw sensor data, 
They don't have any idea for what is going on in the world. It's amazing that they work at all. So these things will learn in an afternoon how to use a new tool and how to do something. And this is cutting edge today. If we can encode this information in our AI, let it try new things, can keep doing more and more tasks. This is excitement, it's how I feel. <laughs> That's how we should feel. So we got, then this one's from Berkeley. This is a classic example. There's so much going on in this little video. Like It looks like an arm flailing around trying to figure out a shape, but what it's doing is it's working just from vision and under, it has pixels and it can see where its hand is in space and it tr creates some representation of that. And it also creates a representation for what block it's holding and what, is it, what's it, what it is holding in its left arm. So it's multiple levels of understanding. It's understanding how to move its arm. It's understanding shapes and symbols. It's understanding what its encoding of its task is. There's this whole question of what's this thing's reward? What, what is its utility function? It's, we could say its utility function is fit the block in the hole, but that's not necessarily going to be easy to put into practice. And the fact that this works is amazing. And this is in real time. You could sit there and watch a robot learn to do something here in Berkeley. What happens if we put a human in the loop? Does it work well? The answer is sometimes, and it's getting better. But ultimately, humans have different motivations. They move differently. And trying to make robots similar to humans is great for inspiration. So there's this whole field of imitation learning where robots try to learn from a human demonstration, which is spectacular, because if you have two demonstrations from a human, and then the robot can though, then go and do the task, there's so many implications in manufacturing and assembly in home tasks, if you have a home robot, you want to train it to do something, you just do it once. But a lot of the tricks come into what happens when the human isn't there, a little bit of noise comes into your environment, and what happens. What's the biggest system that you, th you guys think humans engage with every day that could be automated? Anyone have ideas? Cars. Yeah. Self-driving. How are we going to, is this an easy problem? Think about what's going on here. We got continuous control, a lot of vision, multiple agents. We're going to have weather. Bay Area doesn't really have that, but if you try to take these to Boston, not going to go well. And like, what is even a simple problem doing here? If you have a car trying to merge into a lane, is this easy? It looks like there's space. But what happens when the car is moving fast? This problem is happening very rapidly. There's a lot of moving parts. There's control, there's learning, there's perception. But this works now. And it's only going to get better. The implications for self-driving cars are immense. So think about your parents. Think about anyone that might not own a car. You could just get in a self-driving car for way cheaper if there's no driver. I really want to see it so that everyone can keep interacting with the world, getting out with these cars. And I do think that very soon there will be safer self-driving in all conditions than human drivers. Ultimately, what are we thinking about in this class? Maximize your expected utility. All of these systems I just walked through that are happening today, there is some utility function. We want to know in this class what is our utility function and how do we solve it. Think about the two of these examples that we, saw, that we looked at. Games have a pretty clear utility function, especially board games. You want to win the game. With a robot looking at a towel, like what are, what are you going to think it wants to do? How am I, as a researcher, going to say, oh yeah, you want to get the towel in the shape in a way so that the information is logical to a robot and actually is going to learn this task and accomplish it while I'm sitting there in front of it? But what happens if a game just has something like a score? You can see in this video, bottom left here, there's a score number. And it gets score from leading the race or doing tricks. It's like a BMX race game. But the utility function wasn't clear enough, and all it decided to do is just go around in circles, not participate in the intended event at all, and just get a new high score. So these are the kind of problems. This is an AI where the environment is, a little, is defined. We thought we knew the action space well enough and the utility function well enough. But this is what happens in your class if you're, you don't think about the side cases for what's going on in your um, AIs that you build. This is, the this is the very tricky part of AI and engineering. The utility function is not going to be clear. 
The environments might seem clear at first, but there's a lot of different methods and exciting ways that people are solving problems like this to make things more useful. So hopefully you take away that in this class we're going to learn different ways to maximize your expected utility with computers and hope to see you guys on Friday. <laughs>